Hello. In case you don't watch any of the other revision seminars, you would never know what my face looks like. So, hello, I'm David. Um, I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Centre. I've been asked to talk about equivalence relations. Um, I know quite a lot about equivalence relations. I'm not 100% sure exactly what your course says about them, but I can probably guess. Um, but having the notes wouldn't be the worst plan. Can you yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to talk all about what a relation is, like generally, um, but I am going to talk about what an equivalence relation is. There's another revision seminar where I do talk about um, relations generally. So we have set theory first, then we talk about relations which are basically subsets of the cross set, like the Cartesian product. And then we have three properties that relations may or may not satisfy. Yep. So just as a quick thing here, given a set S, you know, a relation on S is a subset of S cross S, basically. And basically what it is, is that if, you know, if A and B are in the relation, oh, let's call it R, we say that A is related to B. And sometimes you write like that. Sometimes we write that. And it's worth pointing out that sometimes the relation doesn't have a letter, um, it has a symbol. So relations that we care about usually have a symbol and a name, but no letter. And or a name. Not often a letter. So I'm just going to do an example of this. E.g. That R be the relation on the natural numbers where A, B is in R if A is less than B. And see, look, we haven't used the letter R here. We've used the symbol less than, basically. So you wouldn't normally say A, R, B because you've already got a symbol to stand for that. It's basically the, what I'm getting at. So if it's already got a symbol, you don't normally call it, you know, we, you know, we could say A, R, B, but it does already have a symbol. Basically, that's all I wanted to say. The reason I say that The reason I say that is because um, it can be confusing to some people reading this stuff 
when they suddenly talk about modular arithmetic and they've got an, a congruence and it's never referred to by a letter, ever, even though they talk about it being an equivalence relation. So I will, for those of you who are listening to this in the future who are re listening to this as maybe an introduction to equivalence relations, most of the stuff I just said is meaningless and I will get to it. Okay, so basically anything can be a relation and it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to work one way or the other. Um, the English phrase is related to doesn't have a direction. You know, if A is related to B in ordinary English, then B is related to A, which is lovely. But that's not how relations work in maths. Relations don't have to work that way. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean, just note, note also, a is related to B is not necessarily the same as B is related to A. Okay, so it's just be very careful. This area of mathematics has very specific um, terminology and notation and it's similar but not exactly the same as the way ordinary English works. Right, so there are things that relations might have. You know, you can have any relation you like. You can have a relation that says that A is less than B. You can have a relation that says that A is related to B if they both have the, the, the first same letter. You can say, um, being words, you could say that A is related to B um, if they're numbers and they don't have any digits in common. Um, you can say that A is related to B um, exactly when A is the number one, if you want. You could say whatever you wanted and it would be a relation. That's the point of relations. They're an extremely general thing. Equivalence relations are the most special kind of relation. There are other special kinds of relations, but equivalence relations are really special because they behave the way that is related to works. The normal English interpretation of is related to um, does work both ways. And in fact, they work the same way that equals works. So they're called equivalence relations because Equivalence means, equi means the same, and valence means value. So equivalence relations are in some sense talking about things having the same value. So that's what they're about. But mathematically what that means is that we need to look at um, relations that we like, like equals, um, and pull, a, pull out the most important properties that those things have. What information about the relation itself, about the way things are related, tells you that it works the same way mathematically as equals works? So that's our goal. Goal. Find relations that work the same way as equals. Now equals has a lot of properties, um, but there are three main properties that are worth talking about because um, I think as well, I mean over in economics, I don't know about computer science but, or maths, but over in economics at least, relations are really important um, because the relations are one of the ways that human be we model human being decision making. And we say that this option that I might take has a greater value than this other option that I might take. So I can talk about the relation between things that I might buy, for example. And I might have different relations on that. One of them is how much they cost and another one is how much I care about them. And so it's important to know the sorts of properties that relations have so that I can get a handle on how people make decisions. That's how it's done in economics. Not entirely sure how it's done elsewhere. Um, but equivalence relations are the best kind and there are three properties that they have. So, A relation is, note there's three and I'm going to put them in this order. Reflexive when, oh let's give it a name, we'll just assume that you know it's called R. It's reflexive when 
x is related to itself. For all x in the set. Everything's related to itself. Symmetric. When if x is related to y, then y is related to x. For all x and y in S. And it's transitive when if x is related to y and y is related to z, then x is related to z. These are the three properties that make something an equivalence relation. Something that's worth noting about these properties is that this property is about a single object, x. This property involves two objects, x and y. And this property involves three objects, x, y and z. That's the reason I put them in this order. One, two and three. Something else to notice about it is that this one doesn't have an if. It's just something that has to be true all the time. This one has an if. If x is related to y, then something happens. And this one has two ifs. If x is related to y and if y is related to z, then something happens. So they sort of progress in terms of their complexity, these three properties. This property is the most complex, this is not as complex, this is the least complex. That's why we put them in this order, because they, they, this order they become harder and harder to check. Okay. And we can say if R is all three, it's an equivalence relation. So, well, let's just check something. If I replace that capital R in this with an equal sign, it would still be true. X is equal to X, no matter what X is. If X is equal to Y, then Y is equal to X. It works both ways. If x is equal to y and y is equal to z, well then x has to be equal to z as well because they're all equal to each other. So the concept is, is that we've got these three major properties that equals satisfies, but other things don't. Um, and so it's possible for a relation to satisfy any combination of these things. It's possible for it to be not reflexive and not symmetric and not transitive. It's possible for it to be reflexive but not symmetric and not transitive. It's possible for it to be not reflexive and symmetric and not transitive. It's possible for it to be re not reflexive and symmetric and transitive and all of the eight options that there are. And only when all three of them are true is it an equivalence relation. Um, however, once it does become true, once it is an equivalence relation, then we cannot worry about it anymore. Once you know it's an equivalence relation, you can just treat it as if it was an equal sign and everything else that you would normally do to equals is, will apply. So that's why it's important to talk about them because we talk about congruence mod 5. We know congruence mod 5 is an equivalence relation, which means we can treat it as if it was an equal sign to almost all intents and purposes. That's the deal. We can treat it as if it was an, equ an equal sign um, if it's an equivalence relation. Right. So what we need is examples of things that are and are not, just like when you study anything. Um, we've studied graph theory before. Um, in other revision seminars, we've studied other things. 
and over in the other maths courses or maybe in the past if you, or in the future when you do maths you'll find a new object and you'll sit down and go well, what are some things that are and what are some things that aren't so the, one of the things about this is that a relation could be anything it could act on any it could be it could talk about any objects at all numbers letters people countries time whatever and it could be described in any way at all it could be described in terms of a formula it could be described in terms of just some words which is one of the things that makes deciding if things are equivalence relations in some sense harder um, so, because sometimes you might do a calculation, sometimes you might just write a paragraph that describes why. Um, that's the sort of thing we're going to just have to deal with. Because this is a really general idea in maths, and which means we, it, it applies to lots of different things. So, we're just going to have to deal with it. So, I'm just going to do an example and see what we can do. Um, things that are equivalence relations just sound boring, okay, because they just are. So I could say S Let us be the set of all humans alive now, which is a finite but not small set. Um, and be the relation where A is related to B when A is B's mother. I should really qualify that and be really specific, it's like, you know, birth mother. <laughs> there are more than one way to be somebody's mother. Um, so A is B's mother, and I could as assess whether this is an equivalence relation, and more generally whether it satisfies my three properties that I'm interested in about relations. So let's see. We're going to run through. Is it reflexive? What do you guys think? No? Nope. And why not? You're not your own mother. Unless we have time machines, that's not going to happen. So, no. No person is their own mother. All right. What if there were time machines and it, and it was possible for someone to be their own mother? Would it then be reflexive? No. Because there's at least one person who isn't their own mother. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how many people it's reflexive for. If there's one person that it's not reflexive for, then the whole relation isn't reflexive. To be reflexive, everybody has to be their own mother. So since I am not my own mother, it's not reflexive. You only need one person. So even better, I could just actually say, since I am not my own mother. And that will do the trick. If you want it to be reflexive, it has to work for everybody. But if you want it to not be reflexive, it only has to break for one person. I'm glad that that, that works so well. Thank you for playing along, guys. Is it symmetric? No. <laughs> if I'm your, if, if, if my mother is my mother, I am not her mother. <laughs> Again, even if time travel were possible, this still is not true for everybody. <laughs> Not to mention I'm a man, but that's... Depends on the definition of mother, I suppose. Uh, 
transitive? No. In fact, if A is B's mother and B is C's mother, that would make A C's grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a type of mother. You know, if the word that you use has mother in it, maybe. Okay, so you could do that, right? You could say, what if R was the relation, if A is related to B when A is B's insert any number of grands, including none, mother. <laughs> oh, any number of greats and or a grand mother, then it would be transitive. Okay? Because for all the people of which the relation actually does anything, it does transfer from one person to the next. So, no, I'm not even going to put a reason in. <laughs> No, it doesn't. So the question that's been asked for the, so for the recording is that does something need to have at least three values in it in order to be transitive? And the answer is no. Let's make up a random stupid one. Let S be A, B. In fact, this is the entire, everything's related to everything else. Damn it. I'm just going to do it. This is the total relation. Everything is related to everything else. Okay? Which is reflexive and symmetric and transitive. Okay, but I'm just going to do transitive. So if x is related to y and y is related to z that's what I need to do we need so what we need is for x to be related to y and that be meaning that x is related to z but it doesn't mean this thing is, does, is allowed to be the same as that thing and that's okay so I can go a is related to b and b is related to b and that implies that A is related to B, tick. A is related to B, and B is related to A, and that implies that A is related to A. Yes, that does work. A is related to, B is related to A, and B is, and A is related to A implies that B is related to A, tick. B is related to A, and B is, A is related to B, implies that B is related to B, tick, that's also true. And I haven't even done them all yet, because um, you have to do them in order. Oh, crap. You have to do them in order. Um, so I've got A is related to B, A is related to B. I haven't even started with A is related to A. Technically, you don't really need to check any of them, um, like if they're not there. So I could probably make a transitive one that had less things in it than this, you know, etc. But it's still transitive even though there's only two things. Yep. Um, and in fact, if nothing's related to anything else, it's still transitive. Because you can't start the definition of transitive without things being true already. So since you can't start it, you can't not finish it, which means it's true. The empty, the empty relation where nothing is related to anything else is transitive. Any relation on the empty set is transitive. Because, yeah, but not reflexive. So, so. so uh, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, I always say that like if a train system is good when there's no, tra no late trains, then it's good when there's no trains. Because there's no late trains. So there are no sets of things in, there are no, you know, triples of things in the set where it doesn't work, so therefore it works. Yeah. <laughs> That's transitive. Um, I reckon I could probably make one here that was still transitive even though it wasn't the total relation. I could just have A is related to B and 
that's the only thing in it and it would still be transitive. So we can go, well, to be transitive, transitive, A is related to B, but B is not related to anything, right? And so I can't start my definition of transitive, therefore it's transitive. That's it. I know it's confusing. It's just the way it is. Yep, can't be disproven. There are no sets of, there are no collections of things in the set that make it not transitive, which means it is transitive. <laughs> I'm not not going to the party. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that's one of the classics. Okay, so let's do one that is a... Um, so what if we have let S be the set of straight lines in, in a plane, right? I'm going to assume that's the ordinary plane that we're all familiar with be the set of straight lines in a plane and let R be such that line L is related to line M if L and M are parallel. Reflexive. Our lines are lines parallel to themselves? Well, that's a good question. We're going to have to decide based on the definition. We're going to have to decide what it means to be parallel. So if lines aren't parallel, if a line is not parallel to itself, then it's not reflexive. And if lines are parallel to themselves, then it is reflexive. But I could say parallel or equal, hey? Yep. So then, yes. <laughs> Every line is equal to itself, and so therefore it's part of the relation. Is it symmetric? Yeah. Because my very definition is symmetric. Being parallel, if L is parallel to M, then M is parallel to L. Definition doesn't have an order, basically. And transitive, what do you think? If one line is parallel to a second line and that second line is parallel to a third line, must the first line be parallel to the th third one? This diagram is not a description, but we can say, well, if L1 is to L2 and L2 is to L3, then yes, L1 is parallel to L3. Insert extra things to cover the equalness. If any of them are equal, then that'll be fine too. Okay. So this is an equivalence relation. It satisfies all three things.
What does it mean that this is equivalence relation? Well, it means I can talk about being parallel or equal, and I'll include equal under parallel, being parallel in the same way that I talk about being equal. So um, if I've got an equation, I could write equations that say L parallel to L2, then if I do something to do the sorts of things to L1 that sort of preserve parallelism, then I can do the same thing to L2 and it'll be fine. Okay, so you've got to think of what things sort of preserve the equality, but basically it means that um, whatever sorts of things are related to being parallel, if I do them to both objects, it'll still be true. That's sort of the idea. You can do things to both sides of an equation. And it also means that I can collect together all the things that are parallel to each other, and then there'll be another collection of things that are parallel to each other, and another collection of things that are parallel to each other, and I'll be able to separate all the lines into collections based on their parallelism. In the same way that I can co collect all the numbers into collections based on which ones they're equal to, because they're just equal to themselves, but I can collect, um, you know, I can collect mother and grandmother strings into strings of people that are mothers and grandmothers of each other and you sort of get trees, which is a graph theory thing. Um, but I can't just sort of collect a whole lot of people who are sort of mothers together and another group of people who are mothers together. That's not how it works. Um, so, but you can often turn relations that aren't equivalence relations into equivalence relations by extending them across time and space. So, um, being next to someone in the lecture theatre is not an equivalence relation. So, S is people in this lecture theatre Um, person one is equal to person two is related to person two if if they're sitting next to each other. Well, it's not reflexive because you're not next to yourself. Um, but you could change it to sitting within one seat of each other. You're sitting within. You're sitting no seats from yourself, so you could do that sitting. And then you could say reflexive um, P is related to P for all P since you are zero seats from yourself from symmetric Yep, that'll work. If P is related to Q, then P is within one seat of Q. So Q must be within one seat of P. So Q is related to P. And this is a great way to structure a symmetric argument. You say, you should probably say, suppose. Suppose P is related to Q, then this, then this, therefore Q is related to P. That's exactly how you should structure a proof that something's symmetric. Suppose something blah, 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 therefore the opposite. Transitive, so it, yes, 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 no. It's not transitive because if P is one seat from Q, i.e. P is related to Q, and Q is one seat from P, which meant from, Q, from, sorry, R is one seat from Q, which means that uh, Q is related to R, it's possible that um, R is two seats from P. So R is not related to um, P. 
So being within a certain distance in general isn't a um, equivalence relation. But I could say, I could adjust this and say, okay, so let's use this relation, which isn't a written equivalence relation, and I'm going to say that two people in the lecture theatre are related um, if they... Well, this would only work if the lecture theatre was full. Um, <laughs> two, two people are related if there's a string of people to, between them that are related to each other in that string, in the other relation. So you can say two, P and Q are related if, if, P is, if P is within one seat of R, R1 and R1 is in, within one seat of R2 and R2 is within one seat of R3 all the way up to someone being within, within one seat of the last person, then what that would do is it would turn it into um, an equivalence relation as long as the lecture theatre was full. Because if someone in every seat, then um, if you're related to this person, then they're related to the next person because it's all about having people between you. So what that would do is that would cause us to create sections of the lecture theatre that were related to each other. Basically every row would be all related to each other. And so it would really be the same as it would really be the same as the equivalence relation which is you're related if you're in the same row. Um, so that's the thing that equivalence relations do is they create equivalence classes. They create collections of individuals or collections of numbers that are all related to each other. They're all related to each other. Every one of them in that group is related to every other one in that group. And they're not related to anything outside that group. Um, and that's what, it, that's what equivalence relations do. They create equivalence classes. And in terms of that relation, you can consider all of those objects or people the same. Okay, so if, you are, if you're equivalent, if you're in the same row, then you know, it doesn't matter which person I pick in that row, they represent that row. If you're equivalent, um, if you're parallel, it doesn't matter which line I pick as, um, in a group of lines that are all parallel, it represents all of those lines. That's the idea of equivalence relations, is they create equivalence classes. So, create equivalence classes. So the equivalence class with X is defined to be all of the things such that Y is related to X. But what that automatically does which creates a set where they're all related to each other. So with any relation I can create this set. I can pick a thing and say let's find all the things that are related to it. But with an equivalence relation what that turns out to is everything that's related to, to X is also related to each other. And so they're all related to each other. And so I can just sort of represent them. And so I could name this as, oh this is the equivalence class that Dane is in this is the equivalence class, I don't remember any of the rest of your names, I'm sorry. Um, uh, this is the equivalence class that David's in, and, but it could be that the equivalence class that Dane is in is the same as the equivalence class that David's in because we're in the same one. So there's nothing stopping us There's nothing stopping the equivalence class for David being equal to the equivalence class for Dane, depending on what the equivalence relation is, of course. If the equivalence relation is having a, a given name that starts with D, then we're in the same equivalence class. If um, the equivalence class is, is having a, a, a given name with, with five letters, then we're not in the same equivalence class after all. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's the general idea. And it turns out that they're roughly the same thing. If you just take any collection of things that's split up into smaller groups and you just say you're equivalent if you're in, you're related if you're in the same group, 
creates an equivalence relation. If you have an equivalence relation that's described in some sort of random way, it will automatically create groups where things are equivalent to each other. And that's what equivalence classes are for, basically. Equivalence relations sort of create things that are equal to each other. And so when the classic example is, you know, equivalence mod n, sorry, congruence mod n. Um, and it's an equivalence relation. And what that does is it'll loop all, group all the numbers together based on the equivalence relation. So if I did equivalence mod 4, you know, r is equivalence mod 4, like congruence mod 4, it's an equivalence relation. And so I can say, the equivalence class containing the number 1 would be all the things that are related to 1. So it would be 1, and 1 is the same as 5 mod 4 because they're both more than, uh, because the difference between them is a multiple of 4, and 1 is the same as 9 mod 4, and it's the same as 13 mod 4, and it's the same as 17 mod 4, and even in the negatives it'll work just as well the other way. It's equal to minus 3 mod 4, um, and minus 7 mod 4, and any number of other things. And all of those numbers are in the equivalence class for 1. But it would just as easily be the equivalence class for 5, because they're all related to 5 as well. So I could just as easily call this, you know, 5. They're the same thing, because they're related to each other. I don't really care what it's called. I can choose any one of them to call it, and I could say, I could give it a totally different name and call it, and call it the first equivalence class, and not name it by one of its elements, and that might be a little less confusing. It'll be like if you, see, if you have an equivalence relation on balloons, and they're the same, in the same, and they're related if they're the same colour, then you have an equivalence class of red balloons, an equivalence class of green balloons, um, and you can name them by the property that they have, but this would say, this is the equivalence class for this balloon I hold in my hand. That's the one that I have. You know, I've got the periodic table on the wall, the equivalence class if they're coloured in the same colour there, so that I could have the equivalence class for helium, which is the same as the equivalence class for hydrogen, um, because of the same colour. Um, yeah, and, and it really is exactly like this. You just sort of colour them all in, and if they're related, you colour them in, and if they're not, you colour them in a different colour, and it's exactly the same process that you use over in the other revision seminar to produce the connected components um, of a graph. And in fact, being in the same connected component is an equivalence relation, because what you do is you're creating an equivalence class. Anytime you split something into groups and say that they're equivalent if they're in the same group, it's an equivalence relation. So um, it's sort of like way less mystical than it seems. Like, it's like, well, so what does that mean? It's like, well, I don't know. But it turns out that you can say all sorts of interesting things about things once you know it's an equivalence relation. And the thing you say mainly, actually, no, you can only say one interesting thing. You can say there's equivalence classes. That's basically it. <laughs> so some, the other classic example that I know from geometry um, is um, similarity of triangles. Two triangles are similar, that's an equivalence relation. A triangle similar to itself, a triangle is, if it's similar to another one, then they're similar the other way around, and if triangle A is similar to triangle B, then triangle B is similar to triangle C, then triangle A is similar to triangle C. Anything that in natural language tends to work the way equals works, it's usually an equivalence relation. And so big Big clue. So most equivalence relations that you make up for assignment questions often have the word the same in them. You know, sitting in the same row, born in the same year, having the same first letter. They're almost always actually about something being equal. Um, yeah. I think that's enough.